Hope and Richard for his speech and invite Jody to the floor to continue the affirmative case. and shell corporations that exist within different jurisdictions. That's why they're employing accountants, tax agents and lawyers to try and manipulate every single loophole of the tax law that they possibly can. We just don't think that this debate is about people who are honestly and genuinely trying to pay their tax. And even if it is, what's the harm? Now they have to pay the tax that they always had to pay, Mr Speaker. We don't think that that's a great big harm at the end of today's debate. So I've got three things, uh, sorry, four things that I want to talk about in terms of rebuttal. And then I'm going to move on to my standard issue today's debate, which is about why we think this is an extremely harmful policy, because what it does is it allows the most rich within society to continually escape having to pay tax, and the fact that their model is never going to be able to deal with that, and it's never going to be able to catch up. And that's where I'm going to deal with their quibbles about the rule of law. So first thing I want to talk about here is the thing they wanted to tell you about loopholes and the tax. They wanted to tell you that the tax law is extremely complex and it's very difficult to tell exactly what the law is. The problem with that is that you can't just simplify it, Mr. Speaker. It deals with all types of extremely complex arrangements. So their solution was just to say, oh, well, we're going we're to try and make it simpler. The problem with that is that you're just never going to be able to achieve that outcome. The second thing they wanted to tell you about loopholes was, well, actually, the tax uh, the tax agency is just going to punish people for not paying their tax. And they told you that they thought they were applied in a political way. They never gave us any analysis to why they would be applied in a political way. The second thing to say is that we don't think they're trying to punish them because we think they perform a very public service. We think that they have very good structures, and we're going to talk about that a little bit later, which means they're not going to. Finally, as I alluded to in my opening, what's the harm even if people don't intend to escape the law? There's no punishment, there's no criminalisation that they wanted to talk about. You just get a tax bill, Mr Speaker, in the same way that every other bloody person with a society gets a tax bill for their normal yearly earnings. So we don't think that has any of the harms that they wanted to talk about there. Secondly, in terms of their point about disclosure, because they wanted to tell you people will now be more secret. The first thing to say about that is that we think that often the reason they disclose their records is that they have a legal requirement to do so, right? They have a legal requirement to give certain kinds of information to the state and to disclose certain kinds of things to the stakeholder, uh, sorry, to the shareholders within their company. The second thing to say there is that we think that it's actually very important to disclose certain things about your companies in those kinds of meetings because you do want to do things like show that you're a viable country. So, sorry, not country, company, so you can attract things like investments. All of the other things we wanted to talk to you about, about people changing their incorporation status and moving uh, their money offshore, are things that we think that happened under the current system, and we think that he didn't fail, that he failed to deal with all the problems that we had with the current system that uh, we think exacerbate that. So what were the problems that we talked about? The first thing that we talked about is that there's a very real lack of resources. Only responses we heard was, yes, they have lawyers. Well, yes, we agree they have lawyers. They don't have enough of them, Mr. Speaker. The second thing that we told you is that we think the courts are extensively tied up. And the important piece of analysis here that we gave you is that there are very real jurisdictional issues. They never responded to this analysis. And the problem with that is, is that it means that you often can't get the information that you need in order to make a prosecution when you are the state because that information is contained within another jurisdiction. You have to ask another government for their information, but you can't force them to. When you are the company that works within both of those jurisdictions, you inherently have that information because it's your information, Mr. Speaker. So we think you're very easy to be able to get that access to that information. The next thing that we told you is that there is a problem with statute of limitations. They said our model just doesn't fix it. The way that our model fixes this, right, is by issuing the tax bill immediately. Then there's no incentive on people just to drag out court cases for no reason. And we see that's exactly what's happened in cases like Penny and Hooper in New Zealand, where what happened is one 
one case was taken to court. It was a very important precedent case, Mr. Speaker. And so what a lot of the people who are interested in that did is they paid their lawyers to help out on that case. They paid their lawyers to continue to prolong that process. And, and so the statutory time bar would eventually come up and the tax office would be unable to deal with that. How we deal with that is by immediately issuing the tax bill. That means that there is no real rush on judicial review and there's no real reason why we have to deal with that kind of statutory problem. Thirdly, why is our system better? Because they wanted to tell you that the tax office just isn't very well placed to make these decisions, Mr Speaker. And this is when I began to laugh to myself because I actually work in the tax office in New Zealand. You know what they do? They sit around and they take court cases and they think about what that means about the principles of the law. And that's how they apply them in terms of determining when and when not people should pay their tax. They have entire departments, so that is all their job to do, is to sit down and to analyse what a court, what a judge said in a court case and how that means for interpreting the law. We think that they're very good to, at doing that. They're very good at taking cues from the judiciary. Finally, we told you about uh, why they have more incentives in terms of caution, and we never had any real response on that side of the house in terms of why it is they wouldn't be far more willing to act in a cautionary way when the burden has to fall on them and when they have to be the one that takes the court case. Never had any response to that. Finally, in terms of my substantive point, which is also a rebuttal to their ridiculous point about the rule of the law. Because the first thing to say here is that this is not any different to what happens at the moment in terms of retrospectivity, right? When the court assesses something, it's also retrospective because it happens afterwards. We're just changing the actor that assesses it, right, Mr Speaker? What we think actually goes against the rule of law is when you allow certain individuals within society to, to build up the resources that they have and use them to exploit the tax system. And that doesn't just mean that they're able to use their money and use their power to cut down, to cut down the court system, to continue to exploit, exploit like tax loopholes in the tax law. But the final thing that we think that they're able to do is we think that they are able to tie up the legislative process to continue to make these provisions ambiguous so that they can continue to exploit the tax law. And the reason why they're able to do that is because we think that large corporations actually are very good at getting their interests recognised by people who are within Parliament. We think they're very good at continuing to push through ambiguous provisions that mean that they're always going to have things that they can continue to exploit. And the reason why they do this is because they know that most of the time they aren't going to get caught. They aren't, they aren't going to be someone who's tried because that process is far too long. They're able to sidetrack the making of those laws so that those provisions are ambiguous. We're not going to change that on our side of the house, but what we are going to change is that we're going to be able to catch them within those ambiguous provisions. And the more and more that we do that, we can get less and less incentives to try and push through those ambiguous provisions, because now it doesn't matter whether the provision is ambiguous or not, because you're going to be caught either way. That's how we get better tax law on our side of the house, because we think we change those incentives on people when they're going to be caught either way. We think that that is how you effectively get a better tax code that provides more certainty for people. That means that people know better what the outcomes are, and we think that that is how we're going to solve this problem. It's terrible that they let major corporations continue to do this. They have no solution. We do. We propose.